Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Michelle Edwards, the National Specialist for Patient Engagement with the American Lung Association. On behalf of the American Lung Association, we want to thank you for participating in today's program, Clinical Trials, while it's important to participate. Clinical trials are regulated research studies that try to find better ways to prevent, screen for, diagnose, or treat a disease. These critical studies, regulated by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, answer specific questions about new interventions, which can be new vaccines, drugs, and devices, and measure their effectiveness and safety for patients. Today's program will be recorded and available to review as part of the Patient and Caregiver Network. The Patient and Caregiver Network is a nationwide online support program providing direct access to lung disease management tools, education, and connection to other patients and caregivers. To learn more about our lung cancer resources, please visit www.lung.org backslash PCN. Our platform for today's presentation allows participants to ask questions in the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and following Dr. Sosinski's presentation, we will have the opportunity to answer important questions submitted regarding clinical trial participation. We want to thank today's webinar sponsor, Advent Health Cancer Institute, for their continued partnership with the American Lung Association. It's my privilege to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Mark Sosinski, the Executive Medical Director of the Advent Health Cancer Institute in Orlando, Florida. Dr. Sosinski received his medical degree from the University of Vermont College of Medicine. His postdoctoral training included an internship and residency in internal medicine at the Beth Israel Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and a medical oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Harvard Medical School. Dr. Sosinski was most recently the director of the lung cancer section at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, clinical associate director of the University of Pittsburgh Lung Cancer Spore, co-director of UPMC Lung Cancer Center of Excellence, and co-leader of the lung cancer program at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Dr. Sosinski holds memberships in numerous professional societies, such as the American College of Physicians, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and many others. Dr. Sosinski is well-published in peer-reviewed literature and outstanding journals as the Journal of Clinical Oncology, Journal of Thoracic Oncology, Cancer, and Lancet Oncology. Dr. Sosinski's primary research interests reside in all aspects of clinical trials related to thoracic oncology population. He also has been instrumental in the development of many cooperative group and investigator initiated clinical trials. And now at this time, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Sosinski. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> welcome everybody. As you can see uh, by the title slide here, I'm currently the executive medical director of Advent Health Cancer Institute in Florida. We all welcome you to this webinar. I am a thoracic medical oncologist and my practice has been um, restricted to thoracic oncology. About 90% of that is lung cancer. So many of the examples that I'll be using during this discussion today really center around lung cancer in um, uh, clinical trials. So I think one of the first things to understand, um, you know, um, uh, how do I um, uh, conduct myself in, in my clinic in terms of uh, recommending various uh, treatments for patients? And I think these two statements uh, are really something that we need to em emphasize. Uh, today's standard of care cancer treatments uh, were really derived from yesterday's clinical trials. When I see patients in clinic, which I did all day yesterday. Um, I rely on the data that we have accrued from previous clinical trials to recommend treatments and make judgments about uh, what is best for these individual patients. And to extend that, uh, we have to also note that today's clinical trials are hopefully tomorrow's state-of-the-art standard of care. And we have clearly and as I'll show you in one of the slides in this presentation, we have clearly made progress 
And we only make progress through well-conducted clinical trials that essentially tell us at the end of the day, the truth about new therapies. Are they helping patients uh, with, uh, uh, in, in my case, with um, um, lung cancer? So a couple of slides just kind of um, setting the stage for this. And I, I showed this slide entitled The Hallmarks of Cancer. There are a couple of articles written by Hanahan and Weinberg. You can see the reference to the bottom left that have really outlined how, for lack of a better phrase, how cancers are successful. Uh, you can see here, this wheel here has a number of different hallmarks, if you will. Um, it, things like uh, up here, avoiding immune destruction. How do cancers hide from the immune system? Uh, how does it uh, induce blood vessels shown here? We know that cancers have a number of mutations and many of these mutations have led to new therapies in, uh, in, in lung cancer. Uh, when normal cells uh, have damage to their DNA, they have a process of cell death or apoptosis. And cancer cells resist that death uh, pathway, if you will. And so there are a number of things here also sustaining proliferative signaling. You have to have a stimulus to grow. Uh, obviously, our normal cells, many of our normal cells are not growing. I always say, in fetal development, when the thyroid becomes the thyroid, it stops growing uh, and, it, and it obeys those growth signals either on or off. Cancers are always on and they're growing. And so the purpose of showing this slide is just to note that our basic scientists have really outlined a number of these pathways and these pathways have become uh, targets of various therapies. And that's really what's advanced the field. And so when you look at uh, the slide here called the research cycle, uh, how, do we, how do we advance new ideas? Well, new ideas come from a number of different settings. I just told you the hallmarks of cancer. Most of that is basic science bench research, if you will. Uh, this leads to observations and, and new therapies. We bring them into the bedside at, uh, in, in the forms of clinical trials. And also there are observations that we make in clinical practice about the standard of care. And these all really revolve around uh, e each other. Sometimes an idea for a clinical trial comes from an observation that you make in your clinical practice. But all of this centers around that middle bedside column, if you will, about clinical research and clinical trials uh, that are well conducted and tell us how to move the bar forward, if you will. Now, it's important to note that there's a lot of effort that's put into the development of new therapies. You can see here this therapeutic development slide. You may start with five to 10,000 compounds as shown in the upper right. But once you go through the process of validating the target, screening drugs, uh, trying to find the lead um, uh, agents, as well as optimizing those agents, there's a great deal of clinical, uh, sorry, preclinical testing that are done in animal models to help uh, us define what the toxicities and what the doses may be until a drug finally makes it to uh, a so-called IND or an investigational new drug status uh, by the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And so those five to 10,000 compounds get whittled down typically to about one to five compounds that we're dealing with. Now, in terms of types of clinical trials, uh, you can see there are a number here, prevention trials, screening trials, diagnostic trials. What we're going to focus on today are treatment trials, uh, but are also quality of life, uh, natural history and ob observational studies, and then very importantly, correlative studies. If we're looking at new drugs that are supposed to be impacting certain targets or certain pathways, can we really prove that that, that that is actually happening in a cancer patient? And so many of these studies and the correlative studies may require a repeat biopsy at some point during the trial uh, to see if you can document uh, that you're actually hitting the target and, and causing the effect that you want to uh, impact. Now, in terms of phases of therapeutic clinical trials, you'll hear the terms phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, phase one is really sometimes the first in human experience. Sometimes it's combining drugs that we already have on the market, but they've not yet been used together. So there are a number of different phase one trials. This uh, really focuses on what's the, what's the dose 
of the drugs being used or drug being used? What's the best schedule? And, and are there safety? What, what are the early safety uh, signals that you may see? Once you get through the dose schedule and safety issues, at least preliminarily, you want to look at efficacy in a phase two trial. Uh, safety is also a concern. And if there's adequate or substantial efficacy, the next question is a phase three question, which is, is it better than the current standard of care? Uh, and can we advance the overall state-of-the-art treatment uh, by demonstrating superiority of a new treatment in a phase three uh, trial? Now, I told you I'd pick on lung cancer during all of this. This is um, uh, from a couple of years ago, looking at the heterogeneity of lung cancer and a number of different molecular subsets. Uh, and again, it gets back to our scientists understanding the biology of uh, lung cancer. You can see to the left, this uh, pie graph here, um, even though this is all lung cancer, you can see that there are a number of different slices in the pie that are different. And these are various mutations and various fusions, as well as perhaps in some cases, amplification of a gene. Uh, these are different DNA alterations that occur in lung cancer. And again, it's important to understand them uh, because all of these have uh, led to the development of targeted therapies uh, that really target the target, if you will. And this is a compilation of what we call waterfall plots uh, from phase two trials. And you can see uh, in the, in the uh, green up here in each one of these waterfall plots, uh, what the molecular target is, in this case, ROS1 here, uh, RET here, uh, NTRAC uh, in HER2. Um, these waterfall plots, each of these bars are individual patients. And the decrease or the length of the bar is how much the patient's cancer has decreased in terms of the measurement of the cancer. And so you can see that when you have a target, and let's pick on uh, ROS1 here, when you have a target, ROS1, and you use drugs like crizotinib or entrectinib, uh, you can see that the vast majority have, of patients have substantial reduction. Again, all documented in phase two clinical trials that are looking at the efficacy as well as safety in this particular setting. And this proliferation of targeted therapies is shown here. These are the FDA approvals over the past uh, decade or so uh, with various mutations or various DNA fusions, as we call them, that have really expanded the options for lung cancer patients. And again, our job as lung cancer doctors is to get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. This has become, as you can see on this slide, a very complicated assessment. Uh, but again, uh, getting it right the first time is the most important thing uh, to do. The other big understanding that we've seen over the past decade is, is uh, with regard to how cancers hide from the immune system. And there are a number of checkpoints here. Theoretically, since the cancer uh, has a number of mutations that make it different than the normal cells in, 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 in a person, uh, the immune system should be able to recognize uh, over here these cancer antigens, if you will. These antigens are released with cancer cell uh, death. Uh, you should be able to uh, prime and activate uh, through antigen presenting cells and T cells uh, an immune response. That immune response should traffic to the tumor, infiltrate the tumor, and then kill the tumor because it's recognized as form. And we know there are a number of checkpoints, uh, as we call them, the most famous of one that you'll hear on uh, the TV uh, with immunotherapy commercials is PDL one uh, in PD-1. And so it's important that that was discovered uh, as a way for the tumor uh, to inactivate the immune response at the level of the cancer. And again, understanding this graph uh, shows a number of, almost all of these are phase three trials uh, that have led to what I refer to as the immunosunami. So starting back in 2016, uh, a number of clinical trials that we obviously don't have time to go over all the nitty gritty details of all of these, but all of these have led to FDA approvals and expanded the options for patients uh, using the immune system uh, against the tumor, uh, and the results that we're seeing are really quite striking. So these are two broad examples of targeted therapies as well as immunotherapy 
first built on our understanding of the basic science and then going through phase two and phase three clinical trials to really change the standard of care in this setting. Now, is it making a difference? Well, I would say yes. If you look at uh, how new therapies uh, are affecting the death rate, you can see, uh, particularly in lung cancer and melanoma, these are two tumors in which there's a clear role of targeted as well as immunotherapy. You can see the change in the total death has decreased substantially uh, in these two uh, diseases that historically were considered very difficult to treat or recalcitrant cancers. Uh, you can see we're making great progress in this particular setting as a result of first, understanding the biology, second, doing the appropriate clinical trials uh, to make sure we understand the benefit, and then getting these new medicines to the patient uh, for the benefit that you might uh, see. Now, we also know that um, there are disparities and we need to address these. We need to first to be aware of them. Uh, you would think intuitively that all uh, uh, patients getting lung cancer would have access to these sorts of things, but we know that there are disparities out there. Uh, it happens with regard to the access of different populations in the US. Uh, there's a number of contributing factors. You can see them in the box to the right. Uh, social determinants of health, disparities in insurance and access to care, variable quality of care, uh, and then bias and patient and system level factors that sometimes hinder exposure to these new medications. So these inequities do exist and uh, they are disproportionately affecting underserved populations for whatever reason. They may encounter cultural, linguistic, economic, or other barriers to care. But I think this is something that we need to recognize with regard uh, to getting this uh, access to these new therapies, as well as access to clinical trials. Now, this slide looks at kind of the, the uh, complexity of uh, clinical uh, trials. You can see uh, this really looks at the um, process of from the time you discover a drug, which we remember the slide that I showed about the compounds and how you identify these compounds through FDA approval. It's an expensive venture. On average, about $2.6 billion for one drug to be developed. Less than 12% uh, of all the medications that make it into phase one eventually get approved by the FDA. So almost 90% really never make it to full approval. And when you look at the cost of developing these drugs over the past 30 years or so, uh, you can see that um, the cost has gone from about 180 million here, as I mentioned, to about 2.6 billion uh, to develop these sorts of drugs. Now, the cost is summarized in this table. This is the typical phase three protocol um, where you're trying to change the standard of care. And you can see through the early 2000s uh, to 10 years later, the complexity of trials, the endpoints, the things that you're looking at in the clinical trials, the number of procedure, the eligibility criteria, the number of sites, the number of data points that are collected, you can see the dramatic increase in the complexity. And why I point that out is that you need a human infrastructure uh, to get all of this information. And so the infrastructure to conduct these clinical trials is not insignificant in terms of regulatory aspects, uh, data collection, uh, a conduct of the trial, and all these sorts of things. Now, how is that being supported? You can see here over to the right that most of this is supported by private companies, not the public sector. Uh, so the drug industry or pharmaceutical industry is really footing the bill uh, for the development of all these new drugs. So less often is it public uh, support. And then the other issue uh, is shown on this slide here, where we've seen a decrease in the rate of return on investment uh, over the past decade or so. So the trials have become more costly, more complex, and there's the risk of less payoff. And so uh, we all want new medications, but I think it's important that we all understand that this can be a risky business and most drugs don't make it to the market. Uh, but the drugs that do have been well vetted and, and, and have been demonstrated uh, to improve the standard of care. And then the other thing that I worry about a lot is this plur 
proliferation of new drugs. You can see here, um, uh, almost 1,500 drugs were in trials in uh, 2021. That was up about 1,000 drugs from two decades earlier. Uh, you can see that the oncology drugs uh, at, are developing uh, or, or coming into clinical trials at a faster rate than non-oncology drugs. And I worry about how efficiently we can study all of these drugs because most patients don't participate in clinical trials. And it's partly because they may not have access to them or the complexity of the trial. Many of them may be excluded because of selective criteria uh, for eligibility and these sorts of things. Uh, and then if you see at the very bottom here, in phase two oncology trials, only 14% of participants that were screened for the trial were enrolled and completed the trial versus 54% in non-oncology trials. So this worries me because I think there are a lot of good ideas out there that we, we need to study as efficiently and as quickly as we can so we can get the answer. Is it going to advance the standard of care or not? Again, getting back to disparities in clinical trial participation, this was a presentation at our uh, annual ASCO meeting a couple of years ago, looking at the difference between white and black populations. It was significant in terms of either evidence or no evidence of trial participation. All patients with lung cancer on the top and patients with non-squamous, which is the vast majority of patients uh, shown on the bottom. Uh, this disparity needs to be addressed and it is being addressed uh, across the United States. The barriers that we see with clinical trials, uh, again, we've said some of them structural barriers, maybe there's not a trial available for your particular situation. Uh, the clinical barriers, the extensive uh, eligibility, inclusion, exclusion criteria, uh, the discussion about a clinical trial, you can see to the right, if offered a trial, what proportion of patients agree to participate, Slightly more than half will agree, but slightly less than half will decline. And so the reason is why are they declining to participate uh, in a clinical trial? And you can see there's some variability uh, to the bottom right based on race and ethnicity. The barriers include lack of awareness. 88% uh, of participants in this online study, this was a website called getinastudy.com, 88% uh, of participants said they rarely spoke about clinical research with, with others. Uh, fear of the unknown or fear about unknown safety. A physician recommendation. I think it actually really is the responsibility of the physician uh, to be aware and to, and to recommend um, uh, clinical trials for patients. Uh, and 80% of uh, uh, potential respondents uh, say that this is an important factor, that their physician recommends it. Um, Sometimes the clinical trial is asking a lot of patients, and I've always said it's a very noble thing to participate in a clinical trial as a patient, uh, but there are some inconveniences that can be there. Sometimes these are compensated for in the clinical trial, but sometimes they're not. So why do people participate in clinical trials? I think most of the reasons are altruistic. They wanna advance medical knowledge. As I say to my patients, uh, when I tell them about the standard of care, I say, how do you think I know the standard of care? I know the standard of care because a decade ago, a clinical trial was done in your situation, and it showed that this new standard of care was, was better than the old standard of care. So we need to keep that going. I think patients identify with this. They want, if they don't want to help their self, they want to help the greater society of cancer patients um, where there might be a better treatment. So, sometimes there's a possibility of receiving a more effective uh, therapy. Uh, often it's a recommendation from someone that they trust. That should be their physician. 60% of people sought information from their doctor, so the doctors need to be aware about it. Compensation in the experience. We'll talk about the research team in a moment here, but sometimes that can be the reason to, to participate. And then as was earlier stated, uh, what should patients know about clinical trials? Well, clinical trials are highly regulated. These trials undergo intense scientific scrutiny. Uh, they are reviewed by institutional review boards for ethical considerations. These institutional review boards uh, do include lay people that will weigh in on the ethical considerations. 
And the clinical trials are highly monitored uh, to make sure that everything that should be done, as I say to my patients, we're going to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make sure that nothing is left undone or unturned. And so I think that's important that patients know that when you're on a clinical trial, uh, this is the situation. Lots of regulation, lots of scientific uh, rigor, uh, ethical considerations have been considered uh, and they're monitored in a highly regimented way. Again, when I talk to patients about a potential clinical trial, this is what I think they should know. What is their current standard of care option? And how did it become the standard of care? What are the limitations and expectations of the standard of care treatment? And what new idea is being tested in the clinical trial? And why might this idea provide benefit in their particular situation? We discuss insurance coverage to make sure that there are no financial implications. I think it's important to know that we, in almost all institutions, if not all institutions, will review every clinical trial, every procedure, everything that's done on a clinical trial. And if it's identified to be not part of the standard of care, it is typically covered uh, by the clinical trial and there's no financial billing to the patient for these extra sorts of things that we do on clinical trials. That obviously would, would, would not be fair. As promised, here's the clinical trial team. Um, there's a principal investigator, the guy or gal in charge. Uh, the responsibility of the princ principal investigators to oversee uh, the conduct of the clinical trial. There are sub-investigators, which may be other physicians or healthcare professionals like uh, nurse practitioners or PAs. Most of them are physicians. Nurse navigators that help patients maneuver uh, what is typically a very complex medical care system. Uh, each patient has a clinical trial nurse. Their responsibility is to make sure that everything is done uh, correctly on the trial. Now, behind the scenes in the clinical trial are data management specialists. All the information that's generated in a cl clinical trial must be set into a database and analyzed down the road. There are regulatory specialists to make sure that uh, all the IRB issues, all the ethical issues, uh, all these things are covered and that we're in compliance with uh, the FDA rules and regulations. And then obviously I alluded to this before, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that goes into uh, conducting clinical trials. Uh, and so the funding of clinical trials is important. And we have uh, obviously part of the team, the contracting and grant specialists that help us uh, procure um, the uh, monies to uh, to perform clin clinical trials, given the infrastructure that it requires. The process, I think, it, as I said this once before, it should start with your physician. Um, it's very important to patients to know that their physicians are knowledgeable and supportive of clinical trials. Clinical trials are so embedded in the DNA of oncology training that every oncologist should be dedicated to this uh, uh, process. And it really starts with the physician. As I mentioned on previous slides, uh, that getting a recommendation from the physician is important to people that are considering participation in a clinical trial. Discussion with the clinical trial nurse. These uh, nurses that are responsible for the trials are very knowledgeable. They, they know all the details, the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts, if you will. Um, uh, they're a, a really uh, important part of the process. Informed consent, very important. Um, again, getting back to what I said before, you should understand what the standard of care is, what's being done in the clinical trial, why it's thought to be important, what are they trying to prove or disprove or, or whatever. The screening process, uh, there may, may be a number of CT scans or other scans, um, Sometimes there's an extra biopsy, most often not a uh, review of the pathology and are there uh, enough slides uh, from the original diagnostic biopsy to satisfy whatever requirements may be on the clinical trial. Uh, once you get through that and are eligible, it's getting started on the protocol treatment and then obviously assessment of the efficacy. And the assessment of the efficacy is most often based on CT scans and that sort of thing. But other things are often used in this particular setting. So that's kind of the process of the clinical trial. 
The screening uh, can sometimes take a week or two. Uh, and the purpose of this is to make sure that the candidate is an appropriate candidate for the trial and that uh, this uh, person meets both the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And in the initiation of treatment, we often give patients clear calendars uh, so that they know exactly what treatment days uh, are required. Are there additional days for required studies, uh, days they have to get a CAT scan, days they have to get an EKG or, or whatever it might be on the appropriate clinical trial? These are important sor sorts of things. Now, what are, what are some of the myths um, that I think? Uh, treatment is experimental. I hear that term a lot. Um, it's it's a bit of a pain point for me because I don't think it's experimental. I think it's investigational. Uh, as I mentioned, these clinical trials have a lot of science behind them. This is not, um, you know, a shot in the dark. Uh, we understand a lot about the biology of cancer. Uh, clinical trials are testing a specific idea that we think is a good idea in in the in the particular uh, patient. So treatment um, is not experimental. The guinea pig syndrome, many patients use that term. I don't want to be a guinea, guinea pig. Um, well, I mean, you know, again, in modern day, in now 2024, um, clinical trials are very sophisticated. And again, there are, are not trials very commonly out there that you know, you're not getting some form of uh, treatment that it's at least the standard of care. I think that's the important issue is that when, and I say this to my patients too, uh, you should never be on a clinical trial that doesn't give you at least the standard of care. Uh, patients deserve the standard of care. And so you you, you need to kind of dispel that uh, guinea pig that something's being uh, tested kind of in the willy nilly fashion. Another myth is uh, that there's some constraint in decision-making by the doctor in the clinical trial. No, uh, uh, First and foremost, the responsibility of the physician is to the patient first and foremost, not the clinical trial. So we always act in the best interest of the patient, no matter what the clinical trial. And in every informed consent document, there's clear language that you at any point have the ability to withdraw from the clinical trial, withdraw from the informed consent process, uh, and go on with standard of care. The options for standard of care, as I say to my patients, the standard of care treatments are not going away. So they're not going to be limited in all of these issues. The placebo issue, um, there are a number of placebo controlled trials, but placebo uh, controlled trials can only be done where there is no standard of care. So the placebo would be an appropriate standard of care because we don't know that doing anything in a particular situation is really going to make a difference. But again, patients need to be comfortable with that and understand why there's a placebo control in that particular setting. Now, are we making a difference? I alluded to this earlier. Uh, you can see here, looking at the about 20 years of data, um, and this to the right looks at uh, death rates from cancer, both in the male and the female population. Uh, and you can see that the lines are going down that we are seeing a continued decrease in the cancer death rate. You can see for a four-year period from 2015 to 2019, uh, the overall death rate uh, in men, about 2.3% per year, and just slightly less than 2% in female. And I think uh, it's important to note uh, that some of the steepest declines have been in the cancers that we have historically felt where recalcitrant are very difficult to treat, lung cancer in melanoma. So I would argue that we are making progress. Uh, cancer mortality is dis decreasing. I think there are lots of reasons. Uh, prevention strategies, early screening. Uh, again, I've uh, centered my talk today that we understand the biology of cancer more. We develop, we have developed a number of drugs. We've done clinical trials well. We've got them approved, and we've educated people about how to use these new therapies in this particular setting. So this is all part of a big process that I think focuses on cancer patients participating in clinical trials to continue uh, the, the uh, gains that we've made in the overall um, um, uh, clinical trial area. 
How do you find a clinical trial? You should ask your doctor. If your doctor doesn't want to, this is my opinion. If your doctor doesn't want to talk about clinical trials, my opinion, you should get a new doctor, frankly. Again, I mentioned before, it's part of the DNA of oncology training that clinical trials are important. It's the only way that we make progress and we make sure that we uh, develop therapies that are safe and effective. Uh, the, the only way to do, do that is to properly design clinical trials. So it starts with your doctor. Uh, you can go to cancer center websites, either local, regional, or national cancer centers. There are a number of clinical trial websites. I've listed some of them here. This is not a complete list. There's a number of lung cancer advocacy groups, including the American Lung Association, uh, as well as others shown on this particular slide. So it should be no secret uh, about where to find clinical trials and, and, and what may be the options for clinical trials. So I think um, that is my last slide, and I think we're going to show just a, 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 a different slide uh, to, to kind of um, have up while we're uh, doing the Q&A. So I will turn it back over uh, to Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Sosinski. So before we get into questions and answers, I thank you, Dr. Sosinski, for a very informative presentation. Um, I'm sure everybody is going to benefit greatly from having been part of this today. Um, the American Lung Association has several other resources for people um, to delve into further if they if they need to. So I'll leave this up here. But this will also be included with the notes following our presentation today via email. And so we have a few questions. Um, so how can patients from underrepresented backgrounds become more informed and involved in clinical research opportunities? And what resources do you share or recommend to support this? Yeah, the, the, this is an important question. And we, we do know that there are underserved um, pop populations. Um, uh, just getting the word out, uh, as we said on this slide, organizations like the American Lung Association, other patient advocacy groups, I think sometimes patients and families may underutilize the resources that advocacy groups may have out there for them. Um, and, and that's how they can identify um, a potential uh, clinical trial resources in their area. Uh, look around to what cancer centers are around you, depending upon where you live. There are a number of comprehensive cancer centers around the United States, as well as regional cancer centers hospital-based cancer centers and others that are actively doing clinical trials um, and may have a trial that, that's appropriate for uh, you. You have to first be um, kind of um, committed to the idea of a clinical trial uh, in that uh, through the internet or through local uh, cancer organizations, either advocacy groups or uh, like the American Cancer Society and these sorts of things, uh, you should be able to to um, find a clin clinical trial. At Advent Health, we make it a part of our waiting room experience. We, we are involved in a research program right now that um, uh, after a patient fills out a brief questionnaire as well as gives their consent to, to do this, we send them information via the mail or via the internet about clinical trials when they're in that early part of their diagnosis or while they're on treatment, because obviously sometimes the treatment fails the patient and they need to go on to something else. And so a clinical trial may be in their best interest. We're looking at how that may impact the um, participation in clinical trials, which we know is, is at a very low rate when looking at the entire patient uh, cancer population. Um, so those are the just some of the high-level general strategies that that, that we pursue. Excellent, thank you. Um, are these trials known by doctors throughout the United States, specifically West Virginia University Medical? I, I don't know the details of the uh, University of West Virginia, which I believe is in Morgantown. Uh, I know they have a cancer center there and I, I know they have a faculty of a number of different uh, cancer specialists that are there. So I, I but I can't speak to, to the to the um, exact details of what their clinical trial menu has. I'm sure that they do have clinical trials available. I just don't know just how extensive their menu may be. Um, there, there are um, uh, there is a website that I'll call out called 
clinicaltrials.gov um, that has all of the clinical trials ongoing globally. Uh, you can type in your disease, you can type in your um, uh, situation and get some in information about that. Um, it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, and, and I think just in, in, in very fair balance here, um, one of the frustrations that uh, we often have is that uh, although there may be a clinical trial uh, out there looking at your situation, it may be in Sacramento, California <laughs> as one of the sites and not necessarily in Orlando, Florida. And so that creates a challenge. Now, there are certain efforts out there that are trying to change the situation where you can adapt this sort of um, ability to, if the patient is in Orlando and the trial is someplace else, a, a mechanism uh, to try to get access to that trial without having to go wherever that trial is. Now, that's in the very early stages of investigation. So it's certainly not uh, ready for prime time. But I think it's the recognition that how important clinical trials are and what a good option they may be, may be for certain patient situations. Thank you. Can you explain why there is not more use of immunotherapy drugs in lung cancer treatment? And what have we been seeing in clinical trials that are not yet in clinical use? Uh, I'm sorry, Michelle, what was the first part of the question? Can you explain what? Can you explain why there's not more use of immunotherapy drugs in lung cancer treatment? And what oh. have what have yeah. we been seeing in clinical okay. trials that are not yet in clinical use? Oh, I, I, I would argue that we're using a ton of immunotherapy. Most, the vast majority of my lung cancer patients are getting some form of immunotherapy. And I can tell you, I can tell you that um, yesterday I saw um, two patients that are, that presented five years ago with stage four lung cancer, metastatic lung cancer, who got immunotherapy with chemotherapy and who have been off treatment for three years, because we typically give immunotherapy for two years, and whose scans show them in a complete remission. Hmm. I was trained that stage four lung cancer is a treatable disease, but not a curable disease. I honestly think immunotherapy is changing that. Now, it doesn't happen in all the patients. It's a minority of patients that are cured, but I think it's real because I see it in my practice and I saw it yesterday. Um, this is a foot in the door, if you will, uh, that this, uh, um, the manipulation of what I mentioned early on, the PD-1, PD-L1 access is incredibly powerful in some patients. The question is what's next and what, what new immune drugs um, are we using? There are a number of different uh, checkpoints, as I've mentioned that control the immune system. There are a number of different antibodies that are being studied. There are a number of vaccines um, that are being studied in this particular area. Some uh, cellular therapies that are being studied. So it's it's really uh, uh, really an intense uh, area of focus uh, in lung cancer. But I, I have to say, in if, if of all the things, again, I've been a lung cancer doctor for 33 years now. Um, and that's all I've done. I have never seen what many of us are seeing in clinical practice right now, the, um, the, the benefits that, that a significant minority of patients are getting. I don't, I don't want to uh, say that everyone's getting cured. That's not the case. But there is a strong minority, um, 10 to 20 percent of patients that are cured that we thought we would never cure. So to me, that's a that's a foot in the door. The question is, what do we do next? And again, there are a number of things that are being studied, but I would say that that immunotherapy is part of the standard of care in lung cancer. And they're, and they're seeing the same thing in melanoma. You know, we've seen great advances in melanoma as a result of immunotherapy. So, so um, stay tuned. Thank you. Will there be clinical studies for people with asthma? Well, you're going to have to ask a pulmonologist that question because I'm not a pulmonologist, and, and very good. I'm an on, I'm an oncologist, so I don't I don't think about asthma, and I don't know a whole lot about it. Fair <laughs> enough. 
Fair I'll enough. be honest with you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, my husband and I put moving overseas on hold due to his issues. Um, I'm going to assume that's lung cancer. We, uh, when he was thrown off of his first trial, we thought we could start the next one in the EU. We looked into it, but there's one he qualifies for either had rules about health care or residency. We are both EU citizens. Is that so that isn't an issue. The question is, do you have any advice about moving for a trial? We will be moving from Nashville um, to start a trial and hope we can transfer to Germany location. Any advice is welcome. So well, you know, like okay. yeah, it obviously it depends on the individual circumstances, the, the details of uh, your husband's case, um, how how promising is, is the trial, who's running the trial. Um, you know, there are some trials that, uh, for instance, I took care of a lady who was on a clinical trial in Toronto, Canada. Um, we were running the same trial in Orlando, and she was wintering in Miami. And so she came to see me in Miami. And the company that was running the trial, you know, they, they, it was a global trial. And they said, well, you're getting our drug in Toronto. Uh, you're you know, going to be in Miami for six months over the winter. Dr. Sosinski has uh, this trial open at Advent Health. Um, um, you can go there and get your treatment. So those op those opportunities are, are are out there, but there are lots of, you know, the devil's in the details, Michelle, of, in terms of how likely you are to, to do that. And again, how important is it? Um, and, and what are the details of the disease and what are the details of the clinical trial? Um, I, I would explore a possibility um, you know, there may be many situations in when that's, it's just not possible to do that, but I wouldn't, I, I, I would certainly explore it because I've had the experience of being able to do that with a patient on a clinical trial. That's good to know. Um, so if, if a person is selected for a clinical trial, um, would I know if I'm receiving a treatment or a placebo? Um, it depends on the trial. Um, you, you know, again, as I said before, obviously in, in, in the situation of having active cancer, you want to make sure you're getting at least the standard of care treatment. Every clinical trial uh, can't, can't ethically give you less than, less than the, um, less than the clinical, uh, or, or less than the standard of care. Now, um, if, uh, the study is being done, uh, in, um, in because of the side effect profile of the agent, there are questions in which a placebo could be helpful. Uh, you may not know whether you're getting the active drug uh, or placebo. You know, a little insider secret here is that, um, you know, we, we often have as the treating physician, you know, I'm supposed to not know, but if someone is having a side effect, like the active drug versus the placebo, you kind of have the sneaky suspicion that maybe they're getting the active drug and not the placebo. Um, and then there are situations in which placebo is the appropriate thing to do. For instance, um, there's a very famous study called the Pacific Trial. And what the Pacific Trial did was to give the standard of care, which is chemotherapy plus radiation, to stage three lung cancer patients. That's a potentially curative platform. Uh, it has been the standard of care for 20 plus years. And that's where we were stuck for a long period of time. The Pacific trial, what it did was to uh, give the standard chemo radiation, but then following the chemo radiation when it was done, patients got immunotherapy um, versus a placebo. That, that was the appropriate use of the placebo because we did not know that doing anything after chemo and radiation changed any, any outcome. So in that situation, a placebo is perfectly appropriate. You, you'll, you'll also have some studies in, in the placebo world where they kind of pad the deck. Like for instance, that Pacific trial that I just mentioned, the way the randomization worked was that there were two patients that would go to active treatment and one patient on the placebo arm. So, so there's that imbalanced randomization uh, that um, uh, works to kind of encourage patients that they're more likely to get the active treatment than the placebo, although you probably 
you, you won't know if it's a if if it's a so-called blinded study. Blinded study means that the doctor doesn't know, the nurse doesn't know, the treating pharmacist doesn't know. Um, only the central uh, data collection site knows uh, which patients are getting active treatment and which patients are getting placebo. Excellent. Now we're going to go to the questions that have been submitted in the chat. Um, what you what do you usually do with patients that aren't interested in participating in clinical trials? Well, first, I, I try to explore wh why they might not be interested. You know, what what's the basis of their lack of interest? And sometimes there's a good reason. Sometimes there's just there's a there's a misperception. You, you know, I, I had that slide about the. Um, the myths of clinical trials. I don't want to be a guinea pig or, or I don't want to get a placebo or, or, you know, I don't want my doctor to be restricted in, in terms of what he, he or she can or can't do. Um, and so we kind of talk through those sorts of things um, and, 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 and say, um, uh, you know, let's, let's kind of talk and understand why you might not be interested in a clinical trial. Um, uh, so that's kind of how, how I approach approach it. I, I, um, I, uh, you know, as I, I, I said this before, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, having done this for 30 years and been the principal investigator of countless studies over the years, both early on phase one, but more often phase two or phase three, it is a noble act for a patient to put their trust uh, in their physician, in the clinical trial process uh, to define better treatments. Everything that we're doing, for instance, all these immunotherapy trials that I mentioned might be curing people. Those were all clinical trials 10 years ago. And if we never did those, if patients didn't participate, and some of those patients got chemo, and some of those patients got chemo plus immunotherapy, and many of those trials were stopped early, that's the other thing that, that's important to know is that if a clinical trial shows a huge benefit, which these immunotherapy trials did, all of these trials are monitored, as I've mentioned. And if the benefit is substantial, the trial will be stopped and the patients will get the beneficial treatment. So I, I think it's important to, to, you know, again, getting back to um, we are trying to make things better, but we can't make things better unless patients participate in clinical trials to tell us the truth about this. I'm not a mouse doctor. You know, the mice may be doing great on a clinical trial, but I don't treat mice. Um, you know, we have to do it in the human system and we have to get to the truth about is this is this better and is this the right thing for the right patient? And 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 so that's why. Uh, the participation um, is, 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 is again, I've, I'll say this again, it's a noble act uh, to do it, to, to put that trust in the system uh, that you're doing the, the right thing. But it is the right thing. As, I, as I've showed you, we are doing better in cancer. Um, we have a ways to go, uh, but we are clearly doing better for a number of different reasons. But one of the very important reasons is the conduct and completion of uh, scientifically sound and ethical clinical trials that lead to better treatments. Thank you for that. Um, will we see anything in oral immunotherapy in the clinic in the near future? Uh, I, I I don't know in the near future about oral therapies. Um, some of the immunotherapy drugs are are exploring subcutaneous routes um, rather than intravenous routes, which does uh, does have some some advantages um, um, in this in, in terms of uh, the administration of these sort, sorts of things. There are a couple of 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 oral therapies that are looking at some of the pathways. To my knowledge, none of them have necessarily been successful to date. Um, but, you know, stay tuned. Now, in the area of targeted therapies, you know, all of those the targeted therapies that I showed you early on in the talk, all of those are oral therapies. And they're highly effective in controlling lung cancer if you have the, the specific target 
that they're targeting. For instance, I called out ROS1. You know, both crizotinib and intractinib are oral tablets. Um, and they're highly effective. They're what we call small molecules. They're easily absorbed from the GI tract. They don't have to be given IV. Um, and they're highly effective. And, and so I think we will see more oral options in the targeted therapy space. We just recently had another drug, oral drug approved for ROS1 called repotrectinib. Um, that, that's an oral agent. So I, I think we will see more oral agents in the targeted space. I'm less optimistic in the immunotherapy space. Mm. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Sosinski. Thank you, too, for your presentation, um, this thorough discussion of questions that people were so thoughtful in submitting as well. I know I benefited from today's presentation, and I'm sure our participants did. Um, we appreciate you and Advent Health um, very much for your continued support of the American Lung Association. Um, so we will follow up today's webinar with an email with a link to to today's um, webinar, as well as resources. But today, the, this concludes um, today's webinar. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, everybody.